Hello, everybody. Happy Labor Day. Uh, welcome to week two of Intro to U.S. Government. Hope you guys uh, had a good first week of classes. Hopefully it wasn't too hectic. Uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, I really enjoyed watching your videos. It was great to, uh, to learn a bit about you guys and, and hear what you're up to. And you're interested in this course and things like that. So um, if you haven't had a chance to watch your, your classmates' uh, videos, I highly encourage you to check those out. They're really interesting. Um, and I think you guys will appreciate getting to know one, one another as we get into the particular discussions. Okay, yeah, so um, I wanted to start off a little bit of an exercise for this week. Um, in one of the articles that we read last week, there was a statement that came up. It's a sort of a famous or infamous statement, depending on, on where you fall on the spectrum, uh, that was made by Ronald Reagan where he said that government is not the solution, government is the problem. So what I want you guys to do is to pause this video for a second and um, write down your daily routine, sort of, you know, just mundane stuff, the things that you do when you get up in the morning up until the time that you go to bed. And then after you've written down that routine, I want you to take a look at, at those items on the list, and I want you to try to decide whether those items are things that you've done completely on your own or whether the government has played a role in, in those particular items. So go ahead and pause the video now and, and do that exercise. Okay, so, um, you know, I can't say for sure, but I would imagine that, you know, upon further reflection, you probably notice that a lot of the items on your list are uh, related to the government in some way. You know, whether it's, you know, driving to school or driving to work, you know, you're driving on uh, government, you know, government-made and government-funded roads uh, where, you know, uh, there are... Um, police officers out there who, are, who come through the state government that are responsible for for keeping you safe on the roads. There are federal regulations. Um, you know, if you're watching TV, you know, that's going to come through uh, electricity, which is regulated by the government. Um, so really, you know, depending on how far down you want to go, pretty much everything that we do is influenced by the, by the government in some ways. Um, so it's you know it's important to consider it's an important question to consider in the beginning uh, of this course is what role do governments actually play why why do we need governments um, there was a philosopher his name is Robert Nozick and essentially he argued that human beings have uh, you know moral rights natural moral rights and in order for a government to function, if a government's taxing or a government is, you know, compelling certain kinds of behaviors, essentially that government is violating a human being's natural rights. So, you know, if you believe, Nosek, that we have these, these natural-born rights, you have to ask the question, why would we give up these, these natural-born rights that we have? And it turns out um, that even if we do have these natural born rights, uh, if we're operating without a government, things can get pretty nasty. There was a philosopher, another philosopher, an, an older guy, his name was Thomas Hobbes, and uh, he essentially he called um, life without government the state of, state of nature. And he equated the state of nature to something that he calls the state of war. And he said that life in the state of nature uh, for human beings is nasty, brutish, ugly and short. So essentially it's it's constant warfare between two people. Uh, you can never feel safe because you always have to protect yourself from from someone else who wants to steal your stuff. There's there's constant infighting, things like that. Uh, follow up to to Thomas Hobbes was another another philosopher named John Locke, who is sort of a predecessor of uh, the founding fathers and a lot of his ideas were used in the Constitution and the US government. And Locke thought that we had you know, the famous phrase, uh, natural rights to life, liberty, and in his case, it wasn't the pursuit of happiness, it was property. And so the, the role of government in the case of Locke uh, turned out to be uh, protecting uh, private property. And we acquired private property by, Locke said, anytime we mixed our labors with part of the natural world, that property would become ours. So for instance, if we were farmers, um, 
and we found a piece of land and we started farming that land. That land was essentially entitled to us. So in order to protect our property and our business interests and then of course the, the rights to life and liberty, Locke argued that, that there needed to be uh, needed to be a government. So and you know you can see that um, in a lot of countries around the world uh, there, there are very uh, corrupt governments or, or no governments at all and essentially what happens in those cases is that uh, people come together in different factions and essentially like warlords, right? I mean you have different gangs, you have different groups and they, they work together and it's very corrupt and the people who don't belong to one of those groups or gangs um, essentially have no rights and, and no privileges. So essentially the role of government is to function as a legitimate, um, the legitimate use of force where they can uh, you know, mitigate uh, disputes or judge disputes between people regarding property um, and they can do these things sort of lawfully and the idea, the hope is that they do them you know, neutrally uh, and justly whereas if you have these particular factions in the absence of a government uh, they're going to do whatever suits their particular uh, group's whims, whereas supposedly the, the role of government should be to support uh, the rights of, of all of its citizens. So historically, philosophically, uh, even looking around the world today, that's generally the role of government. So the, the two papers that we read that I asked you guys to read last week, um, one was by a guy named E.J. Dion. Uh, he had written a book called um, Why Americans Hate Politics. And the article that I read was essentially a synopsis of, of that, that book that he had written. And then the second thing was by, it was an article by a journalist, Ted Halstead, in the Atlantic Monthly, talking about how the millennial generation is very disengaged from politics. So essentially we, we realized that, you know, government is a necessary thing. Um, but it, it appears to be the case that this particular generation uh, of people and this generation of Americans are very fed up with with our our form of government and politics. So the purpose of of those two articles was to try to explore uh, some reasons why that might be. And uh, for Dion to explore it, he takes a look at um, the Clinton administration, and he 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 argues that that was a turning point uh, in U.S. government. Uh, before before Clinton, uh, we were uh, the the government was running a, a pretty large uh, deficit, and when when that deficit was in place, what that allowed uh, was were very sharp ideological divisions between the Democrats and the Republicans, between the left and the right, um, and that came because the the question was the liberals wanted to add social programs to the government you know they wanted to make sure that that everyone was being treated justly that uh, there was welfare for people who didn't have jobs um, and that the needs of the people were being met the general welfare however the the right or the republicans said well look you know we're way in debt right now so how can we possibly afford to to add these programs so you sort of had like these two ideologies or philosophies butting heads. One wanted to increase social welfare, the other said, well, look, we don't have the money to do it. So when Clinton came in, um, he actually balanced the budget to where there was not a large deficit. So when he balanced that budget, it took away a lot of the sort of the, the argumentation that the Republicans had because they had argued that the type of you know social policies that the Democrats were pursuing under Clinton were going to lead us into, into to greater debt, uh, but it turned out to be the case for whatever reason. There are a combination of factors, you know, for the economic boom that we experienced in the late '90s. <clears throat> uh, essentially, you know, balanced the budget, so it appeared that the Republicans' argument wasn't working. So that sort of you know kind of neutralized in some ways this very sharp division between the two ideological parties. Um, and the, the notion was that uh, rather than focusing on the left and the right, what the people wanted to do was to try to, to actually focus on the problems that were in, far, in front of us. And Dion thought that this was a great benefit of, of the Clinton presidency is that we could be more pragmatic 
rather than ideological, we could focus on the issues that were confronting us, whether it was the environment uh, or terrorism or, or, or whatever. And of course, um, Dion points out that it was unfortunate that the Monica Lewinsky thing happened because it kind of, you know, took away from, from that focus on the particular issues. Um, so, so yeah, so Dion said that the current generation of people uh, who, who are in politics now are um, what he calls balanced budget liberals. So it's a type of centrism where, you know, people are fiscally conservative. People want to be fiscally conservative because they want to make sure that the social programs like Social Security that are put in place are going to be there for them. But yet they are very interested in sort of uh, a progressive social agenda. So it's trying to balance those, those two particular things. But the, the reason that, that Dion claims Americans hates politics is, is this ideological division between left and right, which ironically is not all that different than than the point that, that Halstead is making as well uh, about, he's talking specifically about Generation X, but the reason I included that, that extra report, and I, I want to say that if, if a reading, if I post a reading in the folder and it's not on the syllabus, you guys aren't required to read it, uh, I've just put it in there because I think it might be interesting or it might clarify some of, some of the things that we've been reading. So the reason I put in the millennial report was essentially a follow-up because it's not Generation X anymore. You guys are more in, I would assume, are more in the millennial generation. So I wanted you to see how the trends that, that Halstead talked about um, have moved forward into, into your particular uh, generation. So Halstead essentially makes the argument that Generation X at that point is, was the most politically disengaged uh, generation in American history. Uh, they weren't identifying with the Democrats or the Republicans, Republicans and he said there was a lot of, a lot of apathy there among that generation. And he point, you know, he pointed to several different reasons that that could be the case, but the primary reason was that it appeared that the um, the current ruling political class who happened to be the baby boomers weren't particularly interested in the issues that uh, the generation Xer, Xers uh, thought affected them. Generation X was very interested in sort of uh, financial stability, providing for their own social programs going forward. Uh, they're also very interested in things like environmentalism, equal rights, things like that. And sort of the the catch-22 here is that Generation X was worried that um, that their their needs weren't being met because of uh, the baby boomers were sort of ruling the agenda. So that caused them to disengage from the political process. But of course, the question becomes: uh, if Generation X does not engage in the political process. Then how you know how can their issues uh, ever come to the forefront? So that's kind of a catch twenty two there that they're currently facing. Uh, but they thought once again that sort of this left right paradigm was not getting at the particular issues um, that was facing their particular generation. So that's essentially, according to Halstead, that's the reason that uh, Generation X was disengaging. Um, and then the question, of course, becomes. Um, is the millennial generation, is the same thing happening in the millennial generation, which is why I posted that report. And the millennial generation is actually even more politically disengaged uh, than Generation X. I think right now 50% um, of the millennial generation identifies with a party, either Democrat or Republican. Uh, the rest uh, identify themselves primarily as independents. Uh, however, the, the interesting thing is the ones who don't uh, identify themselves as independents are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly identify themselves as Democrats, uh, which contributed to uh, President Obama's uh, election and things like that. Another really, um, you know, disturbing trend that we've seen uh, since you know the '60s. The University of Michigan has been conducting a study, and it has to do with social trust. And essentially, they ask um, high school seniors one question. And they've been asking the same question for like 60 years. And the question is, in general, do you believe that people can be trusted? And in the 60s, when they first started asking those questions, around 60% of the people said that they thought in general people could be trusted. Um, the millennial generation, I think it was around 32% of the millennial generation. So it had almost dropped in half by, excuse me, by Generation X. Generation X at 32%. The current report that recently came out with millennials is that it's down to 19%. So 
So essentially that means that nine, only 19% of the millennial generation believes that people in general can be trusted. And of course that raises all kinds of questions. Uh, you know, something we have to consider is, is why is that happening? Uh, because, I mean, have people, you know, has the, the moral fiber, the moral character of people changed that much in the past 60 years? Have people really become that untrustworthy? Or are there stru structural factors that are in place that are, are leading us, you know, as a, as a recent generation, to believe that people are less trustworthy? And what are the implications of that for a democratic form of governance? You know, in order to to uh, have a democratic government, we have to talk to one another. We have to collaborate. It's important that we understand, um, you know, how people who are, are not like us are, are thinking about particular issues. And the ironic thing is, is that the millennial generation is also the mo most diverse in history. So we have a generation that is the most diverse, but yet has the least trust, you know, of any in the past, you know, at least 60 years, if probably not farther back. So that puts us in a really challenging place moving forward for, for democratic governance. Um, so that's a big issue that we're going to have to try, to, if not the biggest issue that, uh, that we're going to have to try to figure out maybe in this course and, and throughout our lives is how to regain some of that social trust, how to, to work together with one another. Okay, uh, so that was last week. So uh, this week... Uh, I've posted articles on essentially on the Constitution, and uh, I want you. So we're going to be looking at sort of the historical context of how the Constitution emerged, uh, because of course uh, something you're going to find out if you didn't, you probably already knew, is that the Constitution was not actually the first set of laws uh, that was made, or the first governmental structure that was made um, by the U.S. government. That was the Articles of Confederation. Uh, so the Constitution, in many ways, was a reaction to to the the problems with the Articles of Confederation. So we're going to look at sort of the historical context, what was going on. You can't really separate the Constitution from the historical context. Um, we're going to look at sort of how um, how the Constitution was made through the Constitutional Convention. What were some of the problems that they ran into? You know, how did they actually make it all make it all come together? Because uh, it was pretty clever, uh, you know, some of the, the things that they had to do to make it happen. And one of the one of the papers you're going to read this week is by a guy named John Roche, and he says that first and foremost you have to realize that the founders uh, of the United States were political masters. And he said, you know, too often people try to think of the founders as like demigods or philosophers or uh, you know, trying to imbue some sort of religious uh, spirit into the Constitution. But first and foremost, they were politicians who were trying to compromise to put a government into place that could actually keep the United States going. And there were lots of debates about, you know, how much power should the federal government have, how much power should the states have, uh, things like that. So it was, a, it was a, a long road, and it's pretty amazing that they came out with something as functional as, functional as they did. And you're going to be surprised, I think, at you know a lot of the things that were not originally included in the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, which came much later, um, and how they thought presidents should be elected, and how democratic our society actually is. Um, and then um, I have the the link online to to actually view the Constitution, the Founders Constitution online. It's a fantastic website. If you're interested in the Constitution, it can give you more information than you'll ever want to know. Um, so yeah, so just look at the articles of uh, articles of the Constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights, and I, I would suggest if you have time, uh, read the introduction that they put on the Founders Constitution uh, website because it has a great, uh, you know, it has a great sort of introduction to studying the Constitution and the historical circumstances that that led to its uh, its creation. But you don't have to read, you know, unless you're interested, you don't have to read any of sort of the supporting articles that are listed under the different articles of the Constitution and things like that. Um, so, yeah, so essentially that's, that's what we're going to be looking at this week. Um, I'm going to post assignment two, which will be a discussion question. I'm also going to post some instructions about how you post in your groups and things like that um, on Wednesday. So... Uh, I think that's it. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to, to, to shoot me an email, and, uh, and we'll work it out. It's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting week. Hope you guys enjoy the readings.